Hello everyone and a warm welcome again to our second interview with Professor Robert Bartlett. This time we are going to talk about desire in the Middle Ages, focusing on sexual desire, but we're going to see where the conversation takes us um, for the rest of this hour. So to start off with then, Robert, it's great to see you again and I'm looking forward to this discussion that's, uh, that we're going to have next. Um, how did the concept of desire in medieval Europe differ from our understanding of that word in the West today? Well, I think the first thing to say is I don't think two people would agree about what our understanding of desire in the world today is. So I think we can start with that. Um, it's a very, very uh, difficult topic to talk about, um, uh, both intrinsically, because sexual desire is usually um, a more private and sometimes even a secret uh, aspect of a person's life. Not, not very rarely always public, uh, it shouldn't be. Um, and then, of course, people vary so much in, in what their desires are and how they express their desires. And that's the world today. So if you go back, say, 800 years or whatever, you face then the problem of even knowing basic facts about what we're talking about, desires. I was thinking about it, and I think it's probably best to start with saying, how do we know anything about medieval sexual desire? Uh, and we have two big bodies of information, and they're quite different. Uh, the first is what the church says. Uh, the church had an extremely strong line, a strong and repetitive line, and sometimes a very forceful and authoritarian line on sexual desire. And that isn't direct evidence of what people felt, uh, but it is evidence of what a very important section of society thought and should be the case. It's very often prescriptive what should be the case. So you obviously have that problem of going from that to then thinking what was actually the emotional and sexual reality of the world for people. So that's one big um, area where you, you, could, you could start with if you're thinking about this. But as I said, it has those, those problems for interpretation. And the other big area is um, what you might call loosely imaginative literature. Um, because of course, there's an enormous amount of literature produced in the Middle Ages. And a great deal of it is actually to do with, with love, sexual desire and love. Um, in fact, if we want to go into it, we could even perhaps discuss how romantic love was an invention of the Middle Ages. That's, that's been argued with, with some grounds. Um, so I think the problem there is rather different from the problem of looking at church sources. Uh, there you've got a question that comes up again today, of course, how much is, is literature uh, or imaginative work in general, like nowadays you could think of films, for example, uh, how, how much does that actually reflect any realities of, in people's lived lives? Is it, uh, uh, can, we, can we say it's a mirror? That's a sort of one simple uh, image that's been used, um, but obviously there's a lot of objections to that. Is it an exaggeration? Is it a critique? Is it a fantasy? So all those possibilities uh, are there, for medieval literature as for as for modern modern literature and film so that's i think the first thing to say which makes your a question about uh comparing modern and medieval uh, sexual desire even more difficult but, but let's have a go. Let, let, let's, let's, let's have a go let's start off with the church then the church obviously that's looms right. large in medieval society we talked about it a, a lot last time when we were talking about power in mm -hmm. terms of understanding um, the roles of the different sexes, for example. Can we talk a bit about the importance of religious doctrines surrounding sex and original sin, particularly what, what was going on in the Garden of Eden, for example, and how that related to people's everyday sexual experiences in the Middle Ages? Yeah, absolutely. Um, enormous topic, so I'll just pick a few things. Um, I mean, starting from the point of view, of course, that uh, not only was the church enormously more powerful in the Middle Ages than it is now. I mean, in fact, in some ways, it's almost a defining feature of the Middle Ages compared with the ancient world or the modern world. Uh, and it's a church that is increasingly um, clear that its rulers of the church, the people at the top, are themselves required to be celibate. That is, to be a ruler of the church, to be a powerful person in the church, like a, a, a priest and so on, you have to um, abandon sex, you have to give up sex. And of course, in the Roman Catholic Church, that's still the, still the case today. 
So that immediately makes um, the situation of uh, reading what uh, clerical and ecclesiastical authorities say a bit different because they're talking about something that in most cases they don't have experience of. And secondly, that they have a very critical view of, and that's where you get to the point you were making about the Garden of Eden and so on. And what, what happens in the Garden of Eden? I mean, in, in theory, in absolute theory, theological theory, um, Christian theology doesn't think there's anything wrong with sex. Um, in fact, um, the first two human beings in the Garden of Eden were created and they were expected to have sex. Um, there's some doubt about whether to get, if we're not going to get into the details of this. Uh, some people think that the, the, the Garden of Eden, uh, they, Adam and Eve were only in it for about eight hours before the fall. So maybe they didn't have time to have sex. But um, the question is certainly that in, in the original creation before sin, then sex was still OK. Um, but by the time you get to the human world we live in, um, sex is a, is a form of lust. Uh, it's as the church elaborates its views, it finally comes down to, to two things really on, the, on two basic points. One is the point I've already made, that priests should be celibate. And that takes a little while to be established. Why, why should there? Is, is, is that kind of, it's not really absolutely there from the beginning. Um, and it's really finally enforced seriously in the 11th century. Um, it's been on the on the books for quite a long time, but that's when you have uh, vigorous popes like Gregory the Seventh, who are really keen on priests not being married. He regards married priests as something horrific. And then when it comes to views of uh, lay people's secular people's sexuality, the position is is that the the only acceptable form of sex is between a man and a woman for the uh, ma married man and a married woman uh, for, uh, for the purpose of procreation. That is, it is intended for that purpose. And even something like enthusiastic lovemaking between a husband and a wife, which you think would be perfectly okay, is a, is a, a venial sin. It's a small sin, but it's still a sin. I, I've got this quote from St. Augustine, one of the church fathers, passionate love, if, even of one's own wife is adultery. <laughs> which, which, kind of, which kind of is a, a, a harsh measure to yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. find your own sexual experience in, 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 in within marriage even regarding um priests and and bishops and the wider clergy being taken away from the married life and being be well or, or more or less forced into celibacy by church doctrine does that have anything to do with power and relationships and the fact that the wider church didn't want children born into the church because then it begs the problem of inherited wealth and, and money and land. There's, there's a very strong argument that has uh, been advanced by um, uh, an anthropologist called Jack Goody, um, that that's um, exactly what dictated the church's views on sexual activity, sexual relations, choice of marriage partner, uh, and, and so on and so forth. And that it's, it's to do with um, the church's property. Uh, and of course, that's that's one of the things before the 11th century, um, which is, as I say, when there was a real push uh, towards clerical celibacy, the priest not being married. Um, it wasn't uncommon uh, in certain places for the parish priest to hand on his position to his son. Uh, and even cases of bishops higher up the church handing things on to their to their relatives. Um, so there are certainly cases of that. They were very well established. And, 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 it, and it's possible, of course, that the reformers, the hardliners, have kind of captured the story and that the people who gave their, who, who hoped that their sons would inherit their parish were perfectly decent people and that they, their story has not been quite told with <laughs> quite such vigor as the reformers told their story. Um, but it is certainly the case that if you uh, allow the church property and church position to become hereditary, which is a very natural consequence of having married priests, uh, then the uh, church itself has lost some control of its appointments. It's no longer uh, merit or quality or whatever it might be that is making the choice of a bishop or the choice of a parish priest. Uh, in, it's, the, uh, it's the transmission of property. 
and that's a very very important thing another, another thing of course to point out which we haven't mentioned so far is that it's not simply the church in the sense of um, priests and and bishops and so on um all all male of course all male um, but there are also from early on in christianity these communities of um celibate people uh monks and nuns and we have both we have male and female uh members ded dedicated to the full-time religious life um and one of the things they give up of course alongside sex is property which is an interesting choice um and they're, they're meant to be dedicated to a full-time religious life the most of their uh daily life of ordinary monks and nuns would be the the liturgy the, the round of church services which would more or less fill up all their time because it went on very far into the night and started early in the morning so it was a, it was a major part of their lives and they were um by definition they they vowed chastity poverty chastity and obedience and another thing that was very important was virginity not simply not having sex but never having had sex and it was particularly prized in the eyes of the uh, church in the case of women and th there's a there's a remarkable um little uh, ceremony that sometimes took place not everywhere but sometimes in, in, in medieval nunneries, if there was a procession of nuns bearing candles, the nuns who were virgins would hold lighted candles and the nuns who were not virgins would hold candles that were not lit. And it was a very clear, rather dramatic visual uh, making the point that the virgins were better because of course women could become nuns uh, after they'd been married and widowed. That was entirely possible. So not all nuns were virgins by any means, but it was a, it's a mark of that very high status that virginity had. And there are treatises on it. And, and of course the, the most famous virgin of all, the, the Virgin Mary was the, the model and, and, and the Christian church and Christian theologians had done the amazing juggling act of having a, the most highly revered virgin being also the most highly revered mother, which is a is quite an achievement, really, and 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 and, and an element of the complexity of um, the medieval Christian view of sexuality. How far did this uh, this cult of the Virgin Mary percolate throughout the period, though? Because of this idea that. The, the, the cult of the virgin was the the be all and end all of what it meant to be a good woman both a mother and uh, uh, and as a and as a virgin too was that the same at the beginning of this period as it was at the end did it develop more towards the end i know towards the end of this period you've got the emergence of almost oh, christian mysticism re-emerging haven't you and, and the, the spirituality teresa of avila in spain i'm thinking of um another example i've written down here um marjorie kemp in england is, is yes. another example of that how far did how far did these women want to emulate the virgin mary and did, did that was that the same across the whole of the period do you think well i, th I think two things i, I think that I, the cult of the virgin mary becomes important in christianity relatively early on i mean i'm talking about in the days of the roman empire and, and so on uh, and it elaborates um she has more feast days than almost any other than almost any other saint, right? She has several feast days throughout the throughout the year. Um, her image is one of the most common images in medieval art, um, and it varies. In, there's different forms of the the image. Sometimes she's depicted in a kind of imperial form. Uh, there's a, a scene of her being crowned by her son in heaven, the coronation of the Virgin. Uh, so there's a there's a history to the iconography. Uh, there's um, Maria Lactans, there's, there's pictures of um, Mary uh, breastfeeding the baby Jesus, which is, a, you know, an interesting point if you're thinking about, you know, what's, is this the mother role or some other role that's been addressed? Um, they even had a special category for her because they, they, they made a special point of trying to distinguish um, between veneration of God and veneration of the saints. The theologians did. They, they were quite clear about that. And they took two Greek words, um, Latria for veneration of God and, and Dulia for, for veneration of the saints. And they invented a word, hyperdulia, uh, 
godly <laughs> attitude to the Virgin Mary. Very good. Yeah. It's a very good word, very useful uh, in everyday life. And that she was elevated, as it were, above all the other saints. So, so the cult of the Virgin is really important. The thing that I noticed that um, it's quite interesting. You were asking about, you know, the relationship of the Virgin Mary and, the, and Virgin women. Before getting onto that, um, I think it's rather interesting that the Virgin was revered very much by male clerics and sometimes people, I think always, always of St. Bernard, St. Bernard of Clairvaux, he came from a very aristocratic background. His family were knights. Uh, he um, was an authoritarian figure. He was a, uh, a fighter in the sense of the usual, you know, the sense of politics and argument rather than in, in, in terms of the sword, a uh, great organizer. Um, and he was an absolute devotee of the Virgin Mary. And so it wasn't simply that, you know, women were, were attracted to her as a woman. I think there's cases of very many masculine men being attracted to her as what, as a, a mother or a virgin. But to get to your point about women, we've got plenty of records of uh, saints and holy women, female saints and holy women who really want to preserve their virginity. That's part of their goal. That's part of their image. And, and there, there are long stories about um, how the efforts they make to retain their virginity. There's a, there's a famous account from the 12th century in England, Christina of Marquette. I, I was just about to mention Christina of Marquette. If you could, if you could tell us her story, that would be yeah, excellent. Because she's got I'll, such I'll, a good story. It's a, it's a remarkable story. It's, it's, a, it's a long and detailed account, uh, obviously by... Uh, someone who knew her and got most of the story from her. She came from, not from a, a, a feudal or a landed family, but from an urban family uh, in the east of England. And so she was a um, member of a sort of rich merchant class is what she was a member of. Uh, and she really wanted to preserve her virginity. That was a goal she had acquired. What from, from hearing preaching or from reading or listening to the Bible or what, it's not quite clear. And her parents were just um, outraged that she wasn't going to make a good marriage and have a nice house and so on and so forth. And they tried to get her, a, 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 there was a, a local boy who was interested, you know, from, a, you know, fell up well off uh, um, uh, urban background himself. Uh, and they thought, this is great, this will work. And there are pages and pages in this account of their attempts to get this to turn into a marriage. Uh, and at one point, um, Christina makes the fatal mistake of saying, OK, and once you've said, OK, we might come back to this, uh, what, what constitutes a marriage, right? Uh, once you'd said, OK, that, that was it. And so they, they do all sorts of things. They, they try, first of all, kind of breaking down her urge to remain a virgin by doing things like taking her to parties and, and telling her what nice clothes you get if, you're, if you get married and so on. Um, this carries on for some time. Uh, and in the end, she uh, makes a break for it. She runs away and she ends up um, living the life of a, um, and caress a, fe a female hermit, a solitary. That's, that's, that's where she, where she um, finally attains her, her goal. Am I right in saying though that she's taken in by a male figure? She's taken in by a, a priest who then has a hosts her in his church, which I, which I thought was quite a surprising thing. If she's if she's running away from a man, what was his name Bertred, the the man who wants to right. better, That's isn't right. it? And then she she runs she runs away to this church to the to the organisation of the church, which is there dominated by men pretty much in terms of the clergy. Well, from, and, from, yeah, from from well, his point of view, of course, there, there are there are many examples of this. Um, the you'll find it in in the lives of many italian female saints as well yes the, the the women would would sometimes have male priests or male clergy or male religious like friars and monks who would help them and support them and back them up and also um and i think this is quite important um very often those people those those male clergy and monks and so on would be the people who would write down the account of the holy woman's life that, that's quite common um, to have an amanuensis. Not that you know women couldn't write, but men were more likely to write and, and clergy were particularly able to, to be literate. And so they keep the record as well, which is, which is a thing to bear in mind. She ended up with a loose attachment to St. Albans Abbey. So she had a, a connection with a male religious house because of course, from their point of view, um, 
why should they back up the bourgeois burghers of uh, urban England in the 12th century who are trying to get their, their daughter married? You know, so I mean, it, it's part of the variety of, of these things. Let's talk for a bit next about the interactions between men and women in the church, and particularly in monasticism. There's the one-off story of Abelard and Eloisa. We can we can talk, we'll talk about that, but I suppose that this is this is a story of of a, uh, a monk and a, a nun getting together. But I should think that was the exception to the rule in in this case. How since monasteries inhabited such a uh, a wider social space within the medieval community and nunneries too, how did they stop? Well, how did these, these men and women stop themselves from interacting with the local society and, for example, becoming, well, engaging in sexual practices, I suppose, or at least being viewed as doing that? Well, j just before answering that, um, Abelard and Eloise uh, got together before they were monks and nuns. Okay. They, the love affair was when he was her tutor. Uh, he was a, a, a clergyman, he was, yeah, uh, and she was not a nun. Um, he was her tutor in her house, her guardian's house, and that's when they began began their love affair. And they, it's only after the big crisis when the, the, her, Eloise's guardian uh, got uh, Abelard castrated, uh, and after that, uh, that's when Abelard and, and Eloise entered the monastic and, and the life of monks and nuns. Um, but to go back to your, your basic point, I think monks and nuns didn't usually um, uh, cut themselves off entirely from the local local society. I think they did interact with them. Uh, they were great um, property owners. Uh, most of the, particularly the old monasteries, the Benedictine monasteries had huge estates. Um, there would be the need to organize farms and, and, and labor. Um, nunneries were, there were fewer nunneries and they were usually smaller, but some of them were quite high status and one of the, one of the, the one thing that all, nuns always needed always was a male priest because they needed someone to celebrate mass and do things that only a priest could do and by definition all priests were were male so there would be that and then i think for their work in their estates and so on they would normally have uh, male employees and then of course some of these places were were in towns and it's very difficult to have a community in the middle of a town without interaction. So there was interaction. Um, and you do find cases of um, people breaking the rules, breaking the sexual rules, as you know, any, any society where there are communities of people whose, whose rule is uh, not to have sex. Um, that's the chances of that being 100% observed all the time are virtually nil, I think. So you do you do get cases of that, you know. How far do you think this was dry this was part of the thing that was driving church reform throughout the Middle Ages? Because church reform is a is a thing that the, the papacy keeps coming back to almost all the time, isn't it? And in it's not until I suppose the, the Reformation and the traditional the classic story of Henry VIII rallying against the, the monasteries because of their sexual malpractices and things and closing them down for that reason, which was I suppose a a propaganda exercise because he wanted their money more than anything else but um how much of well going back to my question how much of the the reform element in the church was focused on this obsession with sexual problems and and sexual licentiousness well you had the development um and i think it does develop over the course of the middle ages um to a more intense degree of a kind of policing of behavior by the church um, some of that was obviously addressed to questions like uh, heresy and um, political rows with the powers that be and so on. But a lot of it was to do with sexual behavior. And um, certainly in the 12th and 13th centuries and later, uh, bishops go on their rounds. They, if they're a good bishop, which means a, um, that would qualify, I think, as a reforming bishop, uh, they go from church to church and they find that the parish priest here has a girlfriend and the parish priest there goes hunting which they're not meant to do and so on and so you've got this sort of policing of them um and that was fairly it's fairly general um when um when king john of england was having a row with the church famously one of the things he threatened to do was to lock up all the all the priests girlfriends they were called um 
sort of housekeepers, you know, and that, that would be that these, these weren't, these weren't, they had not gone through a, a service, but they were often um, living permanently with, with, the, with the priests. Um, and then the other thing is that later, it, it, this, this seems to have had its um, sort of elaboration really in the later Middle Ages, as far as, that's as far as the evidence goes. Um, the church paid attention to ordinary lay and secular people's sexual behavior. And the church courts, when they had lo local church courts, this was one of the things that they looked into. Fornication is what was called, um, that is, um, sex between people who weren't married. And there's a really strong strain throughout the Middle Ages of clergy and others saying, what can we do about it? Uh, ordinary people think that fornication isn't a sin. And I mean, that's it's said hundreds of times, right? Uh, they have to condemn it at the highest level. One of the main theologians uh, uh, of the 13th century, Albertus Magnus, even said that to believe that um, fornication uh, is not a sin is heresy, which is putting it pretty strongly, right? Uh, and they tried to enforce this by uh, inquisition and punishment. And the punishments consisted um, partly of publicity, that that was partly how it was done, um, and also by penalties such as fines, hitting people where it hurt in the purse, and then sometimes being whipped around the church, half, half naked being whipped around the church, so public humiliation and so on. These, these things actually happened. And so that was part of a, a policing of sexuality. And that is, that's fornication. This isn't adultery, which is a separate issue altogether, really. And it didn't stop there. I mean, it, it carried on in certain uh, branches of the church. Rob, Rob, Robert Burns, the famous um, uh, Scottish poet, he had to do public penance for, for fornication, which he was famous for. But if, if we move on to the question of adultery, that would be rather different because adultery is uh, also a sin right, in the eyes of the church, but it also has uh, interested parties, uh, particularly the husband. We're thinking about this patriarchal world. It's the husband we're talking about and property, because what happens if the, the woman, the wife has children who are not the husband's children and so on? And that immediately moves it into a slightly different field from fornication. And presumably that's one of the reasons why most people thought fornication was not a sin, because it doesn't entangle um, property and, and male authority and so on in, in, in any way. It's very interesting how the, the, the inheritance rights and the power element come so much into this discussion around sex. One last question on this is, did this reform element in the church ever rub up against the, the spiritual practice that we were talking about earlier, for example, of, of women trying to emulate the Virgin Mary and the, the cult of, if you can call it a cult of virginity. There's an example of an Italian woman, I think Angela of uh, Foligno, who in the 13th yeah. century, who has this practice of offering her body to Christ, which seems to emerge later on in this period in the Middle Ages as being a, a, a spiritual practice, which is very much on the fringes of what church doctrine may well teach. And does that become a problem for those in authority in the church? I don't, I don't think it's a problem. I, I think that um, the general symbolism of holy women and nuns was that they were brides of Christ. And there's an enormous spiritual and, and religious literature based on that. So they, they, they don't want an earthly spouse because they have a heavenly spouse. And that's perfectly acceptable mainline uh, spiritual religion and of course it's one, one of the big things of course that happens with Protestantism is suddenly virginity is absolutely not uh, a major spiritual virtue it remains very important for um, you know teenage girls who are in the property classes that they should be virgins when they get married but that's a very different thing from being a from being a bride of Christ uh, but of course the the end of um, uh, clerical celibacy, the end of monasticism, all these things in, in many branches of the of the Protestant churches uh, was a turning its back on all that. And they would see themselves, of, of course, as a culmination of um, a, a, a kind of long term reform. Let's move away now from the church. I think we've, we've spent a great deal of time talking about it. And let's talk about uh, desire and sex outside of outside of the institution of the church. 
Right. How did things begin to change in this arena with the emergence of the, well, for those those of you who know something about the Middle Ages, may have heard of things like troubadours or, or courtly love and romance. Can you please tell us about how these, these ideas, if they, if they were indeed accurate ideas, emerged and, and what impact they had on society? Well, let, well, let's start with saying what it is we're talking about when we talk about troubadours and, and romance and so on. Um, because some people have seen the, the, the troubadours and romance literature emerge in the 12th century. And some people have seen that as a, a major shift in, um, in people's feelings and people's attitudes to sexual love and sexual desire. And then some people, uh, a rather more cynical view of it, they sort of see it's basically all froth, you know. Uh, it's, or some people would say, well, it's simply in literature, not a change in behavior. So there's all those questions to be thought about. But just to sketch it out very broadly, it's, it's, it's clear that from round about uh, 1100, there are poets in the south of France um, who um, write poetry, uh, which is dominated, it's not exclusively, but dominated by the idea of love and the service of a man to his lady. And so you have, I mean, literally thousands, literally thousands of poems in the Southern French uh, language, Occitan, um, from the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, and it hadn't been there before. Uh, and so there's something new. And then parallel to it, though slightly different, you have the development of what is called romance literature. And I've always thought the, the etymology of it all was very significant because these stories that are being told in they're being told in French more more northern French than southern French like the troubadours mainly are writing in, the, in southern French but there are there are these in the 12th century you have a famous romance writer Chrétien de Troyes these are stories of Arthur and his knights and Guinevere and they concern love as well so just like the troubadours they concern love but perhaps sometimes in a rather different way and the stories are very often about adultery. You have, for example, Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot. You have Tristan and Isolde and King Mark. So you have these stories in which there's a passionate romantic love outside the marriage bond. Now, I don't think anyone's saying that's being idealized, but it's becoming central in a way that it hadn't been before. And then because these things are written in French, not Latin, the local word for French was romance. That's, that's what they called it, romance, uh, because it was distinct, it came from the language of the Romans. And so these, then these uh, long poems, and later on there the are versions of them in prose, they're, they're called romances as well. So a long story about adulterous love is a romance. So then, the feeling of passionate love that transcends normal social bonds becomes called romance. And that's where we get our modern word romance and romantic and romanticism and all the rest of it. Uh, and in French, you have the word roman, which means a novel, because they have invented novels as well. So from the 12th century, you've got in the case of the troubadours and in the case of romances, new literature, new kind of literature in which uh, sexual desire and, and in many cases, sexual desire outside marriage is really central, okay? And that is it's like a mainstream of European literature and it carries right on, you know, Anna Karenina, Madame Bovary, you know, you, you name it, the bourgeois novel. Why, why do you think there was suddenly this mass outpouring there? I mean, the 20th century experienced it in the 1960s, I suppose, didn't it, with a, uh, with a, a decade of liberalisation of, of sexual practices. Why do you think in this part of the Middle Ages we've got that? Is it, is it because of the, the sponsorship from nobility? There's, there's Marie de Champagne and her, her court that presumably are paying for these poets to, to be there and to present their... Their, their case and their work and um, going back to Abelard and Eloisa I think Eloisa says at one point that true love only exists outside of marriage um, so suggesting that I think they were in Paris weren't they in in, in and around tra traveling in and around France as well with these ideas why do you think these ideas emerged at this place and time um, let me put my cards on the table I don't know 
Um, there have been many theories. This is the, what the, we're getting into the sort of sociology of literature, which is a tricky kind of uh, area anyway. It's been pointed out um, that there were many um, small courts in, in France. France was quite a decentralized place politically. There were lots of uh, local counts and dukes and viscounts and even people with a car, just a castle. Uh, and in all those places, there were um, highborn women. Um, and the highborn women seem to have been very willing to have, you know, be, a, be patrons of this of this literature. Um, you mentioned uh, Marie de Champagne, you know, and 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 there are there are many more. Um, I just wonder whether is that all new? Does does that explain the new literature? Are these new circumstances? But that's one of the circumstances that's certainly been been looked to. Um, and then it's, it kind of goes arm, arm in arm or hand in hand with um, other aspects of that literature. It's not just the, the, the romantic love, sometimes called courtly love, fin amour, um, but chivalry as well. The idea of a knightly class who have um, high standards of behavior towards each other, not necessarily towards the rest of <laughs> the population, but towards each other, rules of war. And also that these are people who are, um, they have lady loves and the theory is that you fight better if you are, are passionately in love with your lady love and they have tokens and they have uh, ladies who come and watch them at tournaments and so on, this, this kind of stuff. So there's a, there, there is a new culture emerging in the 12th century. And a part of it is this new way of talking at least about love but i think I, I don't know up to a point of course the the landed class the propertied class are always going to talk about marriage in terms of property because that's what it involves it involves an alliance between two families and it involves the transmission of property um an heiress for example a woman who in in those societies in which women could inherit property uh, was extremely valuable and she was wanted for the property she brought with her. And there was always an exchange of property in, in, a, in a marriage and also always an alliance between two families. One of the curious things about marriage just at this time, just at the 12th century, is that whereas that always continues to be, be the case, really sociologically, um, marriage is the, uh, an alliance between two families and the transmission of property. The church by the late 12th century at any rate, had really come to this position that what made a valid marriage was the consent of the two people. That was it. It didn't require anything else. It didn't require a church ceremony. It didn't require um, the, the, the mum and the dad to agree. Uh, it didn't require the transmission of property. It was just the two people, a man and woman saying, okay, that's how Christina of Markgate got into such trouble because she, at one point she was so browbeaten, she said, okay. And that was taken as being a valid, a valid marriage. That's, so, that sounds like quite a radical change compared to what was there before. I mean, also you've got this, 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 this literature coming out where women are, well, a, a woman with property is treated in a much more respected and uh, well put on a pedestal, almost like you were saying earlier. Do you think this had a, an effect on on the role of women in society, in medieval society in general, or was it just to preserve of those those wealthy elite? Well, well, that's an interesting phrase you use, like being put on a pedestal. Uh, it's that's that's a great uh, um, uh, sentence about this. Um, yes, in the twelfth century, women were put on a pedestal, the better to be ignored, because it doesn't necessarily seem that. I mean, this is a patriarchal society, right? Okay, I mean, patriarchy is a word that you can be overused, but there's no question you would call medieval society patriarchal. Uh, but there is a different way of talking about women. And particularly talking about romantic love, uh, 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 visible in the literature uh, and beyond the literature, really beyond the literature uh, from the 12th century. Um, the question of whether uh, that affected power, female power, I think, is is a different one, and I think perhaps rather hard to to argue, you know. I mean, it's, it's true um, if you look at the very top level of society, um, there are more cases of female sovereigns uh, 
after uh, 1100 in in Western Europe. Uh, as far as I can see, if you if you're just talking about Western Europe, not Byzantium, um, I think there are no cases before 1100 of female sovereigns. There are, there are you know powerful queens married to kings and so on and so forth. After that, I, I counted 27 from 1100 to 1500. So female rule is slightly more common in the in the period after the 12th century from the 12th century onwards. Um, when it comes to property rights, that's so varied across the continent, it's a bit difficult to, to make decisions about that. But there's certainly cases in which um, female, there are female property holders who have clearly control over their property. And the classics that are, are, are always cited are, are widows, because widows will have inherited property from their husbands, if their husbands have landed or, or propertied, uh, and they are usually expected to remarry, but they don't always remarry. Um, so you've got a, a class of women, that's a, that's a sort of life cycle position, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the widow, the, the wealthy widow. Um, so you've got a kind of maybe a rather subtle shift towards slightly more female independence, but it would be very difficult to measure. And of course, it's always entirely subordinate to the giant weight of, of patriarchal organisation. We're not talking about anything like a massive emancipation by any means here, are we? No. Um, not no, with only a few minutes left, um, this topic seems to me as one of the, the biggest topics in which there can easily be misconceptions drawn from it. In particular, I think the way in which we we see our own world can be shaped by the way we understand sex and desire in a in a world which is a thousand years a thousand years apart from our own so do you think there are any misconceptions in this topic that you think need to be addressed in contemporary scholarship or need to be reviewed uh, perhaps it's the way that um, sex and desire is presented in in medieval europe perhaps it's the way um, certain aspects of it are, are ignored for example people's own personal belief in well, we've talked about the virtue of virginity, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, I just wondered about, about your thoughts regarding any misconceptions that you think might, you might like to see addressed. Well, I, I don't know about that, but, but there, if I could say so, the, the, the things that have changed um, over, over my own life in view of this question, um, there have been two big areas which are really uh, a new emphasis on certain aspects of the topic that were they existed, you know, before, but they, they've really become much more central. One, of course, is that just simply the role of women. I mean, there is so much more written about women. Uh, and the more you, you look, the more you find. So that's one area. Uh, and the other big area is the question of um, homosexuality, which is a, you know, huge topic, um, rather um, debated. I mean, I don't uh, myself uh, claim to have any particular knowledge of it, but that if you follow the debates that have been going on, there's a very interesting debate about whether even the concept of homosexuality is relevant when you're talking about the Middle Ages, because it belongs to a time before that concept was, was around, the idea of a particular kind of person. Um, many people would say, well, what really matters when you're looking at the Middle Ages is, is there are certain kind of sexual acts that people do, um, characteristically uh, categorized as sodomy in the period. Uh, so no one's saying there, weren't same, there wasn't same-sex sex, but that doesn't make they're a category of person called homosexual. And there's been a quite a long running and, and quite sophisticated um, scholarly discussion of that. Uh, and these are things that didn't, you know, I wasn't taught them at school, you know, <laughs> so they're, they're sort of new areas that have come into the scholarship. And I don't think they're exhausted. So I think there's probably areas where you can expect more and new work. One, one, one example that comes to mind there, just as you're talking about homosexuality is King Edward the Confessor of England before Harold Godwinson and the Norman Conquest happens. Um, I, as again, you're, you're, I'm pre I presume you're much better read, read on, on medieval England than I am, but my assumption is that Edward the Confessor was, was married to a, uh, an Anglo-Saxon baron's daughter, more or less by force, because of the power play that was going on at the time, and he was renowned as a virgin. That's where he gets his epithet, the confessor, from, presumably. And at, at one point, he even repudiated his wife. He sent her off to a nunnery when um, <clears throat> uh, there, there wasn't there was almost like a, a coup against the 
um, yeah. L. Godwin in, in, in power. Um, so with, in, with that example, you've got someone who was a potentially homosexual, but in actual, in actual fact, his virginity has been celebrated by the church. Yeah. It's kind of come well, full well, circle well, rather than being condemned. Well, yeah, no. As you as you point out quite rightly, he he was married to to uh, one of the Godwins in the family, the, the Harold Harold family, uh, and he did indeed try and get rid of her at one point when he was trying to get rid of the Godwinsons unsuccessfully. Um, he he had no children. He was married but had no children, uh, and you can do various things with that. Uh, there's no evidence whatsoever of um, male favourites of the kind that Edward II of England clearly had, because he's another king who's, who has been portrayed as, as engaged in homosexuality. Um, but Edward the Confessor is not the only one who had that situation of a, of a childless marriage. And I think what happens is if the king has any claim whatsoever to being, um, uh, to have virtue and saintly characteristics, then immediately, childlessness in a marriage is interpreted by the people who are writing about him as a chosen virginity, which of course in the circumstances is a saintly virtue. Um, Henry II of Germany, who lived uh, earlier in the 11th century than Edward, is an exactly parallel example. Uh, king, kings who were married but didn't have children and had anything like a saintly reputation. Edward uh, founded uh, Westminster Abbey, um, uh, and Henry II of, uh, of, of Germany founded uh, Bamberg Cathedral. So they, they, they have churchmen backing them up. And that's when you begin to get this idea of, of, of reputation as, as chosen, uh, chosen virginity rather than homosexuality, I think, in those, in those cases. Um, Edward II, of course, had children. We know it. <laughs> and that doesn't, of course, mean that he wasn't also very keen on his, his favourites, as they're called. I mean, this is, you know, since, since the film The Favourite, there's been a kind of uh, bias in, in, in the interpretation of what a favourite was, I think. Finally, then, we talked a lot about, um, we talked a lot about romance. We talked a lot about the, the role of the church as well. What aspects of sex and desire do you think are still with us today from the medieval period, or do you think lasted at least beyond the 14, 1500s? Oh, I think romantic love. I, I think romantic love. I'm, I'm, I'm quite um, uh, possibly old fashioned in my view. You know, I think romantic love was really took the shape that it did in the 12th century and has maintained that shape with ups and downs and, you know, turns and rounds and stuff uh, up to the up to the present day. If you, I, I think uh, someone like Chrétien de Toile something would have understood um, love actually quite well, you know. Christian de Toile and Hugh Grant, I didn't think would be in the same image, but th but there you go. Well, Professor Bartlett, it's been a pleasure once again. Uh, I don't think there's, I don't think there's many other people I could speak to about sex and desire so easily for an hour and let the time let the time whistle past. It's been a real pleasure, and I've learned an incredible amount. So thank you very much. Great, my pleasure.